Okay, hi. Welcome to our uh, regular regular series, uh, our our seminar uh, where we have uh, uh, talks from from invitees. Uh, we have had uh, many talks before, and this is also part of our our uh, uh, seminar for our students as well. So even our students are here today because some of them will be presenting their their work uh, today or later. But right now at four o'clock, always we have an invitee who will present. So today we are happy to uh, have uh, Leonard Fisser. So he's, he's from uh, Teu uh, Haha, uh, Technical University of Hamburg. Uh, and he has, uh, at least what I know of, uh, he has been working with uh, smart grids uh, LTE and uh, machine to machine communications. Uh, I, I hope I am right. So this is what I have heard from, from where, what he uh, works, works on. Uh, of course, his talk will be related to that. I, I see the abstract <laughs> and I will leave uh, it up to you to, to do the, to the uh, introduction of your topic and, and go uh, further. So, but uh, to, for the record, uh, he will be presenting, uh, his title will be on communication networks for distributed control in smart grids. So Leonard, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks Thanks very much, uh, Sangha. Yeah, um, also a warm welcome from my side. Um, I'm really happy that I was invited here to present our research. Um, like Asanga said, it's going to be on communication networks for distributed control and smart grids. Um, yeah, and I think we can directly start. Um, yeah, maybe we can start with a brief introduction about myself. Um, I'm Leonard and I finished my Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering 2018. Um, and then afterwards, I basically um, did my master's also in electrical engineering. However, there I focused my studies on information and communication technology, which in turn led me to my current position. Um, I'm a research fellow and PhD candidate um, at the Institute of Communication Networks at the Hamburg University of Technology. Um, the Institute is chaired by Professor Andreas Temgier. Um, and so we have quite a close relation to Comnet's Bremen. So I'm double happy to present here today. Um, and my general research area is as already stated in communication networks for smart grids. And I work on a third party funded project, which is funded by the German research foundation DFG. More on that later. Yeah, so as a kickoff for this talk, I want to talk, uh, start with a really brief introduction about why we talk about smart grids, right? So when I talk about smart grids, I'm referencing the distribution grid level, and that is the low voltage domain. So the regular 230 volts or 400 volts you get, for example, at home from your socket. And this distribution grid is rapidly changing. You might have heard of the green energy shift of, in German, the Energiewende. Um, where we are in introducing a lot of different and new components, right? So we have battery storages at home. We have a private batteries, especially. We have electric vehicles um, demanding a high peak charge, um, a peak charging rate. We have solar panels um, introducing generation to the distribution grid. And also we have the electrification of the heating sector. So there are a rapidly evolving amount of new energy resources, and I'm going to summarize them, them now as distributed energy resources. And they pose a problem for our distribution grid because traditionally it was not designed to handle such dynamic and high load scenarios or generation scenarios. So what distribution system operators, so the operators of these energy systems are now looking at are advanced control schemes to actually solve some of these problems. Um, I brought you just an example called peak shaving, which is the, the process of taking some peak generation and or load scenarios and trying to shift and shave these peaks off a threshold. It's a really general, general term right now, but it's just that we are in need of actively controlling some of the things which are happening in our distribution grids, right? So peak shaving just takes the, the peak generation 
for example, and off puts that to another part of the distribution in time, right? So maybe we can um, store some energy in a battery and then inject it to the network later. Another example would be that we have a power budget and we have multiple vehicles trying to charge and we assign that power budget, for example, to the first three cars and then the fourth car arrived and the question now is what do we do, right? Do we reduce the charging rate of the initial three cars? Um, does the fourth car have to wait until it can charge? And all these questions didn't really exist before and not, we're only now looking at them in the distribution grid. And these are not easy to solve uh, in a passive way. So what DSOs are now doing, they introduce some kind of active control, right? So they, they have to actively control some of the components in the network, in the grid. Um, and they can do so in a centralized way or in a distributed way. Um, so we can have a centralized controller issuing control commands or nodes can, could communicate with each other dynamically and then come to a cooperatively to a control decision. In any of these control cases, we as communication network engineers are going to be the core enablers, right? So none of these communication, uh, none of these control problems or applications will be solved without a reliable, robust and low latency communication. Um, there's just no way we are going to solve these complex problems without a communication network. And this is why we are talking, when we talk about smart grids, about communication networks most of the time. Having that said, as a brief introduction, I would like to talk uh, for the rest of this talk about three main topics. I would like to go into more details about the background information, as well as our um, research project. Um, then I would shift the focus a little bit more to numerical results and my PhD work. And at the end, I would like to come back to this um, project and say a little bit, say, some little um, anecdotes to advanced topics as well as outlook for our project. So let's start with a little bit more founded background information and problem description. Um, we are currently developing or working on a DFG funded project um, and it's called Oral, um, which I ha have to thank Kujana for the acronym, but it basically states that we have looking at optimal utilization of renewable energies and low voltage power distribution systems. Um, and while this is a really convoluted term, it focuses on three main parts. We have the renewable energies, so solar, battery, liquid, electrical vehicles as energy storage. We have the low voltage domain, so we are on the distribution system. And then we have some kind of optimal utilization, um, which is an application, a control algorithm, so to say. Um, and we have funding for three years, although I see that this is a typo, that's 2020. And nevertheless, we have three years of project duration and we are currently finishing the second year. So end of next year, we're going to hopefully finish with this project. And it's a project which we do in cooperation with the Institute of Electrical Power and Energy Technology. So they are the experts on anything electrical grid related while we are supplying them with the communication network. A little bit more into detail on how we are imagine, imagining such a complex interdisciplinary cooperation and system in the end. What I show here on the right hand side is a really general case of a distribution grid and how they look like in uh, today's system. So what we have here at the top is a substation, a transformer supplying energy from the medium voltage grid to the low voltage grid. So we are here at the 400 volt section. Um, and then we have a series of buses which connect to houses, to solar panels to charges and even maybe some private wind, wind generators here. But in essence, it's what the distribution system already looks like today. What we are now introducing and looking at in a more detailed way are intelligent node controllers, these I and C here marked in these white boxes. And they are going to complement the already existing infrastructure by establishing a communication channel, right? So, we have these dotted lines between the INC, which um, indicate that we are able to communicate between the INCs. And all of these controllers will now cooperatively um, 
establish an energy management system which is able to solve exactly these application problems I stated earlier. For example, like peak shaping or this um, charging rate distribution, how we allocate power budgets in our network. Um, and that's the idea that we have, right? So we establish a communication network using smart controllers, and these controllers are going to take care of um, the not so nice operational boundaries of our distribution grid. Um, how does it look like in a more detailed way? Well, well, this is a rather convoluted slide, but this is just everything our INCs are going to, to solve for us. Um, so I marked this dashed box here, you can see it in the middle, and that's the INC, right? So on, run, on the right-hand side, we have some input which we receive from the communication network as well as our local measuring device. Um, then we do some electrical grid calculations, right? It, that's basically the control algorithm. And then finally, we are going to communicate, again, some of our local measurements as well as our control decision to the other consumers again. Um, and from a communication network point of view, we are really only interested in the in the left hand, the, the most left hand side and the most right hand side, which are the receiver and the sender, and where the data has to go, right? So I marked it here. We are sending data to other producers and consumers, and we are receiving data from other producers and consumers. Um, and the nice thing is with this cooperation, we don't really have to take care of the middle part. That's what our cooperative uh, institute is doing. Um, so for us, this is just a black box, which we have to supply data to. Yes, of course, we are also developing these algorithms in the middle, but from a pure point of, from a communication network point of view, we are only dealing with sending and transmitting and receiving these control data. Um, so when we summarize our overall distributed optimization problem, it's more that we have multiple of these optimizations running in a distributed way. Um, and each of these INCs compute some local control decision based on global information. And that's the later part is the key part here on global information requires us to exchange information between these devices to have a global view into the network on into the electrical grid. Um, and these informations have to be periodically broadcasted. Um, and to, to get now to a little bit more an abstract level, I'm going to introduce what I call a status update system. Um, and a status update system is just a system of nodes in which each node has to periodically generate status information and which has to be delivered to all other nodes in the network, N minus one. I hope you see the, the um, similarities between our distributed optimization problem and the status update system, because in theory, they are equivalent. Um, but the status update system doesn't really care about what kind of application is running. It could be peak shaving, it could be anything. And what it only cares about is that we can periodically generate um, status information and deliver it to all other nodes in the network. From a communication network point of view, we basically have to support this status update system by implementing an all-to-all -all flooding protocol, right? So generally, the dissemination of a local information to all other nodes in a network is called flooding. And this special case, we have all-to-all -all flooding, so all other nodes are also trying to disseminate a status update. Um, we also have some additional requirements, and first of all, these local informations we create at each node are snapshots of measurements or snapshots in time. So they will they are going to lose value, right? So we don't really care what happens happened 10 seconds or 10 minutes ago. We are only interested in the most recent information from a node and that should be as up to date as possible. Um, and just to give a little bit of a context about the required bandwidth, we are trying to, to realize a system where each node updates all others in the range of one second or, or in the range of seconds here. Um, so it's not just one update every 15 minutes or something like this, but we are talking about a rather high update interval for the um, electrical grid environment. Um, yeah, so you all, when you see that it's maybe a little bit difficult to, to grasp the performance of a protocol in such a status update system, um, but luckily, there is something which is called age of information, and that's um, a, 
performance indicator of a protocol, and it quite well matches and captures what we are trying to achieve in our status update system. So I'm going to take some, some minutes now to, to introduce this um, metric so we can talk about later a performance evaluation. So age of information was initially introduced for vehicular communication, especially for platooning, um, and it captures the freshness of data, which is exactly what we're trying to optimize in a status update system. Um, and it does so by combining update intervals, so how long we have to wait until we can send the next update, and the dissemination time, which is more closely related to classical metrics like delay or latency in a network. Um, and when we do so, we can come up with a graph like on the right hand side, and I would like to start here at this first dashed line, where we see that we are creating a new transmission, right? So it's a TX position. So some node in the network creates a new information packet, and that has at the time at the timestamp it was created an age of information of zero, right? It was just created. It's a local snapshot right now at the same time we create the transmission. Um, and then you're going to transmit this data, and at some point it's going to be received at our receiver. However, during that time, it linearly ages with time, right? So the information, because it cannot be updated in real time, is aging in the network during the dissemination time. So when we receive it at our receiver, we can only set the age of information indicated by the solid line. Um, to the actual dissemination time it took us to deliver this information. Uh, and then the receiver can only wait until the next update arrives. And during this waiting time, you can see that the age of information also linearly increases with time. So as we wait for new information, the information ages in our buffer. Um, so we have this update interval and the dissemination time, which are going to influence the shape of this curve, right? So, so the lower the update interval, the lower the peak age of information and the lower the dissemination time, the lower the like the minimum of this function is going to be. And what we are generally interested in is we are trying to minimize this average age of information, for example, here, um, which is just the average over time. And to move a little bit away from all this electrical stuff, we can introduce an abstraction, which I'm focusing also my PhD on. Um, and that is that we are transforming the, the question from our project, how we can coordinate these distributed energy resources optimally to the question, how we can minimize age of information for status update systems. Um, because the nice thing is that the research question answered in the first place for all the project requires us to answer the, the lower question, how we can minimize and realize such a status update system. And if we optimize the lower question or optimize the problem in the lower question, we implicitly also optimize the performance of the control algorithm. Um, so this allows us to basically neglect, in most of the places, neglect the initial application scenario and just focus on the communication network side of the view and minimize the age of information as an abstract key performance indicator. All right, so this was a brief introduction about how we are going to look forward um, and how we are going to evaluate our network um, performance. And now I would like to go a little bit on the, a little bit more yeah, specific scenario and show some also numerical results. Um, and for that, I'm going to reference a previous publication um, Professor Tim Giel and I did, and that's from last month. Actually, it was just two weeks ago that I presented it. Um, and it's called Minimizing Age of Information for Distributed Control in Smart Grids. And it was published on an IEEE conference on smart grid technology. Um, and the main yeah, contribution of this paper was that we introduced a topology model, so how our nodes are distributed in space, um, which is a requirement for something like simulation, um, as well as we devised a flooding protocol, which exactly realizes this all-to-all -all periodic, all-to-all -all status update flooding. Um, and obviously, we evaluated it for age of information. 
Um, if you're interested in this in a more detailed way, you can find all of the simulation code in the sense of open science at our GitHub. So if there's anything you want to like to reuse in your research, feel free to, to use that code available online. Okay, so let's dive directly into some numericals. Um, we are going to start with the modeling of the topology. Um, and you might ask, why are we in need of this, right? So why do we need to model anything? You can just look around and see a lot of distribution grids around, right? So why have this abstract modeling? Well, the problem is that electrical grid is considered mission critical infrastructure, and most of the operators do not disclose their topologies online. So when you are in a research project without a um, yeah, industry partner, which actually operates such grids, you have to come up with some other ways to, to model the topologies. Um, so what we're really interested in is how the distribution grids look like, right? Because the, the buildings or the consumers will, are going to be our nodes and the way they are spatially related to each other is going to be our topology. Um, luckily, there is an already established approach available um, and it was published 2014 um, at CIRIT. And we, we took this approach and we simplified it even further to the point where it's now just this three-step process. And I'm going to talk to you through this process now. So we're going to start with an open street map data set, which is just like Google Maps, a geographic information system. Um, and you maybe can already make out that we have streets right in this data set so we have connections of um, streets and a street network and we also have buildings i mean it's maybe a little bit difficult to to see in a real but at least for the ones at computer screen in front of them you can see that we have some buildings um, which are located in this data set and in the first step we're going to get a, uh, get rid of all the unnecessary information and only extract the building graph which is a graph without edges and the street graph, which is a graph without nodes, but only edges in that sense. Um, and you can see them here, right? So the blue points are the building, uh, the building graph, and the connections are shown in a faint gray line, which are going to be the streets. And you might ask, why are we looking at streets and buildings? Well, if you look at distribution grids in the European energy grid, uh, you will find that most of the distribution lines are installed underground and alongside streets, right, on the pavements for maintenance reason. They don't, uh, mostly are underground because, um, yeah, that's just the way we, we utilize our um, infrastructure. So when we try to now generate and synthesize electrical grids, we are going to use the street graph as candidates and possible locations for cable installations. Um, and now the question about where we're going to install these cables is just an economical question, right? So the DSO generally try to minimize some cost function. And for example, we used now as an, an, yeah, an abstract version of it, the total line lengths installed. So how many cables do we have to install to establish a distribution grid? Um, and if you want to minimize this value, well, then we can just use clustering approaches, classical clustering approaches, for example, K-means or K-medioid, and when we do so, we can come up with something like this, which are the boundaries of our final distribution grids output from this clustering approach. Um, and I have to say, it's sure, it's an abstraction. It's something um, which, is, which is using some simplifications, but we're seeing quite a lot of nice characteristics um, from real distribution grids. And that is, for example, that nodes within a street are generally in the same distribution grid. Um, and the also nodes which are secluded are uh, within their own distribution grid and not connected to, for example, this ne network here. Um, we do a little bit more detailed um, fitness evaluation in the paper. Um, yeah, but this is an abstraction which is better than assume something random, um, although it's not as nice as having real world topologies. For the rest of the presentation, I would like you to focus on topology A and topology B here, I marked them in red. Um, and these are going to be our test cases for our evaluation. So anytime I'm going to reference one of the, these, uh, just think back to this um, slide here and have topology A and topology B, um, where we have 58 nodes and 158. So a small topology and a big one. 
All right, now you survived everything up until the point where we can talk about communication. Um, so how are we going to organize the all to all flooding problem? Why do I call it problem? Well, it's complex. We have n to n minus one different data connections and we have to realize an efficient way about how to handle all of these. Um, and we're going to start to have a look at a really simple case here, a logical mesh network on the right hand side. Um, it could be a wireless mesh network, for example, using CSMA CA. Um, in any case, we have some, some mesh connectivity. And the first thing which we are going to do to get, a, get, yeah, get this mesh complexity under control is to use a, something called the virtual backbone architecture. And that is just promoting some of the nodes, for example, node five and node six here, to be backbone nodes. And they are going to form a yeah, let's say digital data highway through the center, through the node topology. Um, so these are going to take care of most of the dissemination work um, while also accumulating some of the acknowledgement or control traffic, right? So these are going to be the key nodes in our dissemination process, which are going to disseminate the data and take care of control information. All right, so when we have this in mind, we can reduce some of the complexity away and we just have this simple uh, simple network here. And we're going to start discussing dissemination here in a really simple way, and that is sequential flooding. So sequential flooding is a common approach in literature um, to solve the all-to-all -all flooding problem by basically introducing a one after each other policy. We are just going to split this all-to-all -all problem in multiple one-to-all problems. And yeah, this is just a round robin fashion about how we solve it. How does it look like? Well, for example, at time step one, we can disseminate the data of node one through the network. And then once that is finished, we can disseminate the data of the second node. Once that's finished, we can disseminate the data of the third node, four, five, six. So we are going to distribute them in time and have them transmit after each other. The really nice benefit of this approach is that we have no resource contention between the different data flows. So at any given time, the packet that is currently being disseminated has the full network capacity. There are no other competing flows which are going um, to co cause collisions or some store and forward, some queuing delay. So the each individual dissemination time really, will be really, really short, right? So we have high capacity links um, and communication channels so that's going to be quite nice. However, the main drawback now is that we have to wait until all updates are finished to, so that we can start our next update, right? So node one, for example, has to wait until the seventh time step to send data again. And it's going to increase uh, um, the update interval. Or have, so we have a large update interval. And if we remember what we have in age of information, it's dissemination time and update interval. So right now we have a really long update interval and that's not going to be perfect in the end. Um, so how are we going to address this? Well, we're going to treat the sequential flooding protocol, uh, which is established in literature, as just a special case of a more general approach uh, by, by increasing the number of parallel floats. Um, it's a little bit convoluted, but we, are now, we now have a parameter called K, which is, describing the number of parallel happening sequential flooding processes. Um, and we are going to divide our N nodes into K sets, each with a cardinality N by K. Um, and now multiple of these sequential flooding processes are going to run in parallel. Maybe it's a little bit easier to understand with the graphic. So at time step one and K equal two, we are allowing node one and two to, dis to disseminate data at the same time indicated by these um, shared links now. So basically they are going to contend for resources in the network, but once they are finished, we can start in time step two with nodes three and four. Once they are finished, five, six, and so on and so on. And forth. Um, you can also think about K equals to three, where we would just have two sets of three nodes each. Um, but the main idea is that we are trading higher resource contention, so more collisions, more queuing, more, um, more medium access delay for shorter update intervals. We don't have to wait for six disseminations, but just two happening at the same time. So at time step four here, 
node one and two would be able to send data again. So unfortunately, we can't have uh, both of best worlds, short update intervals and uh, short um, dissemination times. So we have to have some kind of trade-off and that's going to be key, the key part of the evaluation we had. So we asked ourselves how many parallel streams will minimize the update interval while keeping the dissemination time low. But you can also rephrase this question about how many parallel streams are going to minimize age of information. They are equivalent in their research question structure. Um, and this is something which we can do numerically, for example, in network simulations. So right here, you see the number of parallel streams on the x-axis. This is the param parameter k, um, and it goes from one to 58 because we have 58 nodes in the topology A. Um, just, just a, a constant which we can um, see here at the end of the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we see the average age of information. So the general performance of our protocol. Um, and then we have two data points. We have a red data point and we have um, blue data points. And I can't really go into detail here because of time constraints, but when we look at the red data points, they are labeled static retransmission timeout. Um, and this just describes on how we are handling retransmissions. So, you know, when we have retransmission and acknowledgements, we have to wait for the acknowledgements. And if they don't arrive, we have to retransmit. Um, and here, the, the timeout when this retransmission happens is just set at the start of the simulation to a fixed value, um, which is a protocol parameter then. Um, if you don't know the optimal timeout, well, that's not really nice to configure. And this is why we have the dynamic retransmission timeout here marked in blue, um, where we are estimating the round trip time of communications on transmissions. Um, and so we set the timeout to a dynamic value being estimated by uh, in the network congestion style. Um, yeah, so let's look at the actual data curves. Maybe you can focus on the blue one uh, as it's a more general case. Um, and for k equal one, which is sequential flooding by nature, we see that performance is not that great because as we increase the number of parallel happening streams, streams, we also see that age of information um, decrease, so performance increases. But at some point here around uh, k equals six or seven, we see that the age of information increases again. And this minimum here is exactly the point where lowering the update interval is counteracted by the longer dissemination times and our, our overall performance gain is not as great as it could be. Um, so this is our oper op op optimal operation point. We also see a local minima here at 29. Um, and that's just the way we handle these sets, right? So we have 58 nodes. And when we should divide that into 29 sets, well, that's going to work out quite nicely into sets of two. Um, however, this is not the case for an imperfect divisors of the number of nodes. So this is just a special case, which is outperforming the others. We also do an evaluation on peak age information. So this was average, um, but that's covered in the paper. Um, and I would like now to go a step back a little bit and look at a more broader evaluation. So the first question, how does it work with higher data rates? So on the left-hand side, we see now three different K values, K equal to one, K equal to K naught, which is the optimum. You remember the, the minimum on the curve from before and K equal to N, which is the maximum number of um, streams possible. And then you see the average age of information from two megabits and 11 megabits on the file layer. And the first nice thing which we see is that by increasing the data rate, we are achieving better performance. So that's at first um, kind of nice result. Also it's trivial. Um, but then when we look closer at it, we are not scaling that well. So we increase the data rate by a factor of five, but our, by our, but our performance only improves by a factor of two roughly, for example, in this case here. Um, and we look into it why this is happening and it's because our data packets are rather small and we send a lot of acknowledgements and acknowledgements and small packets don't really benefit that much from higher data rates, but more from the medium access scheme. And in this case, it was CSMACA. So we have this um, diminishing returns we get with higher data rates. And in the second scenario, we looked at topology B where we have triple the number of nodes. Um, 
And you can see that both of these graphs look really, really similar. The only thing that changes is the y-axis scaling here. It scales up to 20 seconds and here it's just four. And obviously that's also to be expected, right? When we have more nodes, disseminations are going to take longer. Our network is larger. So average age of information should also be larger. However, and one might argue that an increase by five in the performance, right? A decrease, right? It's a factor of five between these two graphs is not that great when we compare the scaling the number of nodes, right? So we have triple the nodes, but five times the average age of information. However, we have to consider that we are in an all to all flooding problem. So the problem complexity increases exponentially with the number of nodes or quadratic in that sense. Um, so having a factor of five is not that bad compared to, to the increase of um, the co complexity increase of the problem. So in the end, we still condemn this to be a suitable scaling, um, favorable scaling in that sense in the end as well. And yeah, to maybe to sum up this part, um, what are the going to be the next steps regarding this? Uh, we would like to adjust the reliability levels. So right now we are ensuring full dissemination. So every packet arrives at every node um, by introducing a significant amount of control overhead with acknowledgements and retransmissions. And we would like to solve that by allow, also allowing partial disseminations. So um, maybe it's not worth it to spend a lot of time disseminating disseminating data to the last node, maybe we should just start the next dissemination. Um, so this was, would reduce control traffic and, and the preemption of such a dissemination might increase the update rate overall. But that's too complex to just say trivially, so we maybe have to verify that first. And the second approach is something completely different and it is based on network code flooding. Um, I can't really go into detail here, but network coding flood, flooding, network code flooding seems like a really nice application scenario for status update systems where you have this periodicity and you can map that quite nicely to generations in network coding. Um, and finally, we also are looking into analytical models of the entry of information for exactly this flooding protocol, PSAA, as well as network code flooding. Um, but that is not finished yet, so it's currently under development. All right, I still have five minutes on my um, clock and I would like to bring back all of, our, this, all of this discussion to our initial question about the oral um, application scenario and how we are going to, to verify that age of information is equivalent to the control efficacy of a distributed control algorithm. And for this, we have a co-simulation platform. And I guess this is a rather big uh, graphic for just four minutes. But the main, the main point here is that we have a currently a simulator for the electrical grid. Uh, it's called Opal RT. It's specialized hardware for hardware and the loop simulations and emulations of electrical grids. And we are currently interfacing to that. And, through our lab network into something which we call oral network emulator. Um, and you, you can see a familiar um, ac acronym, it's INC container one and INC container two, um, which are exactly these INC nodes I talked about earlier. So we are extending the, the, um, yeah, the, the lockdown Opal RT simulation environment using an external network emulator, which we're developing. Um, and these nodes are going to be able to communicate with the electrical grid via a TCP connection, but they're also going to be able to communicate with each other through a basic UDP application. Um, and in between these two containers, we have something called Flow Emo container, um, which is an emulator being currently developed by Daniel Stoltmann at our institute. Um, and this Flow Emo container is going to work on real Ethernet frames. Um, so in theory, we could directly exchange it for real world um, Ethernet cards. Um, yeah, and this is just the test setup, which is close to, to um, being done. Um, however, not in time for this presentation. Otherwise, I would have shown a demo on it live. And then we would see the direct mapping between age of information and the control algorithm run here in, in our INCs. In any case, um, I would like to, to close my presentation on the conclusion. So 
uh, maybe to remember what we talked about at smart grids, about smart grids, um, we have a multiple a multitude of different applications. They all have their own requirements, um, but they have in common that the communication network will be the core enabler for them. Without that, without this communication network, they will not function. Um, and for research, we can to some degree abstract these applications as um, with age of information, right? So we can focus on reducing this or minimizing this age of information instead of always having to look at these complex control algorithms. Um, for all, we are looking into exactly quantifying this relation between age of information and control efficacy. Um, and for that, we are building this co-simulation environment, um, you know, which is going to allow us this joint evaluation of what in essence is then a cyber physical system. And for my PhD, I'm, I'm more looking looking at advanced approaches to this flooding problem, for example, network coding, um, and also the analytical formulations for um, the mapping between the flooding protocol and the age of information uh, distribution, for example. Yeah, and with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Um, thanks again for the invitation, and I'm happy to answer any questions or start a nice discussion. Thanks. So, yeah, thank you, Leonard, for your presentation. So the floor is open for questions from uh, the audience here, as well as uh, the others, all uh, people who are connected to Zoom. I have a doubt. So you said the, regarding your information dissemination, there are two background nodes which will like send the data to the nodes around. So are there any loss of information here or is it always the data is delivered to the nodes? Uh, you mean here on the more general case? No, in one of your flooding dissemination. Ah, and, and this one, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, of course, there's going to be losses on the channel, yes. So with the results I showed um, were generated using NS3 as a network simulator. And we implemented this flooding protocol as applications there. Um, and we definitely have packet losses. Yes. Um, this is also why we see a significant amount of acknowledgement traffic and retransmission traffic and our simulation results. Mm. Yeah, basically this. <laughs> so uh, we, we're trying to. So in our approach, we are ensuring that data arrives at all destination nodes. So from the control algorithm perspective, data always arrives, although it might be a little bit older. Um, but we definitely have losses in the network as well as delay. Um, but these are going to be covered by the retransmission approach. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. you talk about the sequential flooding, so which means where you have node number one and two and so forth. Mm -hmm. so how do the nodes in the first place know what is their address? Is there some yeah. protocol that they work it out at the beginning, or did you manually configure it for the moment? Yeah, good question. Um, right now, we assume that so for the sequential one, you can just use your um, node ID, right? So node one knows that it should start and node two knows that it's its turn afterwards um, and the dissemination status so how does node two know that node one finished right that's also a question which has to be answered and that's going to be that's actually done in a network in simulation we have control messages indicating when the dissemination is fully finished and node two might start its own dissemination. Um, the structure of the more complicated case where we have multiple sequential flooding processes, for example, here, node three has to know when node one finishes because they are in the same sequence in that sense. Um, this kind of thing is uh, pre-computed before the simulation. So that should have, would have been um, already established by some handshake algorithms at, in the first place. Um, however, the, the triggering of a new packet dissemination is done via control messages. So it's just this initial computation which is taken as already done here. But there's no ideal back channel somewhere 
um, triggering something which is not realistic in the, in the real world then. I have a connected question to that. You just said that the roads are somehow pre-computed. That's mm -hmm. something which I didn't also completely understand. Like for a single flooding, let's say when node one is flooding the whole complete network, mm -hmm. what kind of flooding do you use? This very simple, everybody broadcast once and then I'm done, or do you have some sort of optimal broadcast or? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good question. I didn't really talk about that. So we started with a probabilistic flooding, right? So we have this kind of probability, but we quickly found out that it's not working uh, that great. Uh, let's say it this way. Um, so what we did instead, we opted for this um, virtual backbone architecture, right? So we have these elevated nodes, node five and node six here. Um, and each of the node is aware of their parent node, also pre-computed at the start. So we have some, topology, um, let's say configuration, that basically the nodes know who are their parent nodes and to whom they should forward their data. Um, and the parent nodes know their neighbors in the MCDS, in the backbone network. So we assume that there is some routing information available and we are using generally broadcast. So we are first disseminating from node one to the backbone node, and that is going to take care of all its children, in this case only node three, um, but also forwarding it to node six, and node six is using broadcast to, to send to node two and four. Um, and when they know that all the children received the information via acknowledgements, they are going to report back to node two that it shall start its dissemination. So it's a, it's a, it's a structured uh, flooding in that sense. Um, okay. using and, pre, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and you use the same backbone for all broad for all floodings mm, yes it's that may be something to an idea like because mm -hmm. i can imagine that um you can actually compute also optimal trees which are combination of trees i'm not sure that you that no that was not understandable um <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Now, for example, when you're trying to send uh, at the same time to flood from node one and node two, mm -hmm. okay, if you use exactly the same backbone, of course, there will be contention on the on the on the mm -hmm. links, right? Because they use always the links, but some of the links are not used at all. Mm -hmm. So, for example, and you can compute probably in an absolutely optimal way, linear programming, whatever. You can compute actually overlapping trees, which use the minimum amount of the same links. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so we would reduce further the contention. Mm -hmm. That's true. So we would establish something like domain collisions, uh, yeah. collision domains, um, which should not overlap or should minimally overlap. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, we are partially already doing that in a sense when we have a lot of streams going on at the same time. Um, we don't do it in the way you, you just described it, but we are, we are calculating this minimum connected dominating set, okay. which is going to give us the, the tree through the network to all, reach all nodes with the least amount of broadcasts. Mm -hmm. So this is already maximizing the distance between collision domains um, as we try to maximize the distance, the logical distance between nodes, right? So we want to reach all nodes with the least amount of broadcast, which should, which nodes should transmit. Um, and basically what this will result, us, uh, result in is that these backbone nodes are most of the time at the edge of the communication range. So this also means that they're rather far away in the collision domain. Um, and when we have a lot of flooding processes going on at the same time, they're going to naturally distribute themselves to the exactly these backbone network nodes. Um, but this is something which implicitly happens and we don't really consider it before. It might be better to do that before. That's correct, yes. Okay, okay great, thank you. I also have a question. Thanks a lot for, for your presentation. And actually, I have a question regarding your simulation platform. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And then because I saw that you connected also the power system side, connected to the communication network, I would like to know if they are synchronized together or you just, uh, for example, simulated your networks part with the network emulator and modeled uh, the power system side or no, they are just connected to each other and sync. Mm -hmm. Um, are you referencing to the evaluation I showed or to this screen here? Probably to that screen, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so this, first of all, just to clarify, this evaluation here was done without any consideration of the electrical grid. Here we use the assumption between when we minimize age of information, we implicitly optimize the control performance. Um, so here, there is no assumption on the electrical grid, other than the topology, of course. Um, in this case here, we are actually removing this assumptions and have the electrical grid modeled as well. Um, and this model is basically so fine grained that we're down to the sinus, sinusoid, sinusoidal wave simulation, right? So we are here running at microsecond sampling intervals of the electrical grid, right? Um, and this is going to be a really close match, a really close modeling of the electrical grid. Um, and in, inside this electrical model, we have, we do have positions where we take measurements and can control actions. And these are going to be virtually mapped into these INC containers here. So we do have uh, a synchronization between the electrical grid here in this emulation as well as our nodes. Um, but this is still something which we are looking into it, right? So it's, it's I, I think this block is mostly implemented already. We are just waiting for the hardware to arrive on the left-hand side as well. So here we would have this synchronization between communication and electrical grid, while in this evaluation, we didn't consider it, yes. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Okay, any more questions from anybody from the room? I have a more, sorry, I have a more kind of a theoretical question. Oh, well, theoretical. Mm -hmm. um, in that project, like maybe you, maybe somebody else, are you planning also to implement or to design such these coordination algorithms of how actually to coordinate all of these uh, power sources and how to exchange power and things like that? Or are you looking only at the infrastructural layer, how to organize that? No, we are actually looking into how to set specific electrical set points for active and reactive power for devices. So we are more in the first case you said. Um, so we are looking into the active control of devices, which is going to directly influence the charging rate the solar power injection, the battery stages, state of charge of batteries. So we are controlling these devices. Yeah. And maybe how as well, or is it more a application scenario here? Yeah, that was the question, whether you will try it also with something a concrete application scenario where you say, okay, I would like to use I don't know, the lawnmowers in the mm -hmm. houses which have some tiny batteries to actually load the electric car of the neighbor <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so on the electrical side, we are differentiating between uh, flexible load and unflexible load. And something like the lawnmower would be considered by us as unflexible um, as it's maybe just a little bit too small to be actively controlled. Um, however, we are looking into scenarios where we have electrical vehicles discharging to allow others to charge. Um, that's definitely a scenario. We are looking mostly into edge cases, for example, like solar power injection congestion, where we have a lot of solar panels generating a lot of power and the network cannot handle it. Um, so we would have to curtail some of them. And the question is now, how much could, do you curtail each of these devices? Okay. Um, but we're also looking at the other case where we have too, too less capacity to charge all electrical vehicles, for example, at six o'clock um, when everyone comes out and wants to charge. Um, 
And then the question comes, how do we model user behavior and how do we model utility? And that's then um, what we're doing cooperatively with the IET. Yes, but we do look into active control of exactly these devices. Um, we look at four devices, which are um, PV, so solars, electrical vehicles, heat pumps, and batteries. These are the main big ones we do consider. Okay. Okay, good. I think we are almost at the end. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, I, I have to offer. If there are, feel free to send me an email. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm, I'm sure people, if they're interested, they will write to you. So, okay. yeah, thank you uh, once again. Uh, Shadi, you have something? Uh, no. No. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Leonard, for giving yeah. us a, view, uh, uh, a window <laughs> to your work that you're doing. It was a nice presentation. Thank you for uh, accepting the inv invitation to present.